welcome to Medical Dialogues. I am Dr. Nandita Mohan and today I will be taking you all to explore the world of rare diseases and my topic for today will be prion disease. Now to give you an in-depth knowledge about this, we have with us today Dr. Rahul Chavla with one year of overall experience in neurology. He has completed his DM in neurology from India's Apex Institute, Ames, New Delhi and he has been trained in handling all sorts of neurology emergencies as in stroke, status epilepticus, NMS etc. and even handles OPD cases from all subspecialties in neurology including epilepsy, movement disorders, neuroimmunology, stroke, cognitive neurology etc. to name a few. Now Dr. Rahul Chavla also happens to be a prolific writer and he is the founder of PMT Guru Mantra which is a website for NEAT aspirants. So welcome to Medical Dialogue sir, it's really a pleasure to be interviewing here, you here today. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm really happy to share the stage with you and share my insights on prion disease. Great, great. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, again. So primarily sir, if I may start, can you describe what is prion disease and uh, how are they different from other neurodegenerative disorders? Now that we're talking about rare diseases, how is it considered to be a rare disease? Prion diseases are neurodegenerative diseases which are acute to subacute in onset and they are ultra rare like the incidence is reported to be 1 to 2 per million uh, in US population per year and uh, they are spread through prions now these prions are something which are which is sort of a connecting link between a living and a non-living thing so prions are not cells they are not uh, viruses or bacteria they are just infectious proteins so prion means uh, proteinaceous infect uh, in, uh, infectious particles. So these uh, infectious infective proteins they were first discovered uh, by uh, uh, various scientists, including uh, Stanley Prusner, who described the prions. And some cases uh, of the prion diseases were discovered, were seen and reported by Christopher and Jacob, after whom the uh, Christopher Jacob disease is named. So these prion diseases are ultra rare. They are universally fatal, uh, the mortality is 100% and there is no cure and they are rapidly progressing. Uh, great, that's a very uh, specific explanation of why is it considered to be a rare form. Uh, now, if we discuss this in a little detail, if you can tell us the most common forms of uh, prion diseases in humans and uh, what are their typical clinical presentations? So, prion diseases are transmitted uh, due to various you know, uh, modalities. Most of them are sporadic, that which are 80 to 85 percent. Others are familial as well. Some are iatrogenic as well. Could be because of like dural uh, implants or uh, intracerebral electrodes and uh, various surgical procedures. Some are uh, like a variant CGD, which spreads through uh, having a contaminated uh, beef, uh, uh, the beef of the cattle who might have had a bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is a sort of a uh, you know, uh, prion disease. Uh, there, there is there was a uh, there is one more disease known as Kuru, which was uh, found to be uh, uh, prevalent in a uh, tribe in uh, Papua New Guinea, and uh, it was uh, due to the consumption of uh, human infected infected human brain. So the cannibalistic ritual that was prevalent in that tribe that led. Uh, to the Kuru disease and when it was discovered the practice was banned so all are the these all are the transmission modalities of prion diseases and uh, when we talk about prion we mainly talk about the human form of uh, prion disease which is CJD and in the CJD sporadic form of CJD which is most commonly seen so when we talk about sporadic form of CJD it is commonly seen between the age group of 55 to 65 years of age and uh, it mainly presents with rapidly progressive dementia. The patients present to us with neuropsychiatric manifestations as in memory decline, behavioral abnormalities. Besides, patients have some cerebellar symptoms like ataxia and nystagmus. Patient might have pyramidal weakness or extra pyramidal symptoms like dystonia, tremors, rigidity. So these sort of clinical presentation with rapidly progressive dementia uh, is the primary uh, uh, clinical characteristic of prion disease mainly the sporadic CGD we are talking 
understood uh, now coming to my next question talking about uh, the diagnostic criteria so what are the current diagnostic methods or probably the criteria that is needed for prion diseases and how effective do you how effective uh, do you feel are they in the early disease detection so prion disease the diagnostic criteria of cgd uh, was developed by who and recently cdc also came uh, came up with its diagnostic criteria so more or less you know it's like uh, the uh, amalgamation of the clinical characteristics with the uh, imaging and eg finding which we get in cgd so uh, the first thing is that patient must be having a rapidly progressive dementia and when we say rapidly progressive it's usually less than one year or could be less than two years as well most of the patients you know uh, of the sporadic cgd they present within four to five months of disease onset that is the median duration of the disease and ultimately within a year of onset of the disease patient uh, uh, you know they die so the ultimately more most of the times patient present to us within 5 to 6 months not more than that and within these 5 to 6 months patient have extensive decline of uh, memory extensive decline of cognitive functions they uh, they have behavioral abnormalities their hallucination psychosis and then cerebellar features as described so such patients presenting to us with rapidly progressive dementia and having two or more of the uh, following uh, in, uh, important clinical symptoms as in pyramidal weakness or cerebellar symptoms or myoclonus myoclonus is very characteristic finding of cgd patients and or extra pyramidal symptoms like dystrophy uh, like rigidity or dystonia as described so apart from that the patient must be having a uh, specific findings on mri and eeg so in mri what we see is that uh, if it's sporadic uh, if it's sporadic cgd there is a cortical drifting sign that is very characteristic of uh, cgd or there is basal ganglia uh, hypertensities and on eeg we get very characteristic periodic shock wave complexes now these these periodic shock wave shock wave complexes are usually seen when the disease is very fulminant and in the initial part of the disease we can miss out on the eg findings so if we have a patient with rapidly progressive dementia and we are considering the possibility of prion disease that it is very imperative for us to repeat the eg at regular intervals and there is quite a likely possibility that the initial eg must have had missed those findings and we see those findings in the subsequent eegs so these two uh, are very important uh, uh, modalities the other is the csf testing so in the csf we usually test for 1433 so the 1433 protein is positive that is considered uh, as a marker for cgd okay uh, understood uh, now uh, we've come to understand what prion diseases are and uh, the diagnostic criteria and the methods that are needed now coming to the next aspect what are the treatment options that are currently available for patients with prion diseases and how effective uh, do you feel are they in altering uh, the disease progression this is universally fatal it's not treatable and when we say it's not treatable it's not treatable uh, in terms of uh, curability it's not curable what we can offer to the patient is little bit of symptomatic treatment for seizures for myoclonic jerks otherwise the disease is rapidly progressive there is no cure and we know ultimately the patient uh, will have mortality but what is important is that prion disease is very rare condition and it's sort of a chameleon uh, it's a great mimicker uh, it has a number of differentials so whenever we uh, consider uh, the possibility of prion disease we first consider other diseases uh, which are more common and which can have similar presentation which can even have similar eg or mri findings so we tend to rule out those uh, uh, more common diseases first and once they are ruled out and then only we go for the testing for prion diseases so for example if the patient with 55 or 60 years of age presents to us with rapidly progressive dementia then we do need to rule out neuro infections we need to rule out any autoimmune or perineoplastic encephalitis or uh, uh, if the patient uh, uh, and we do need to look at the mri findings if there is a cortical dribbling sign or there is some other uh, you know structural lesion sitting over there so there is uh, so prion disease is usually sort of a uh, diagnosis of exclusion in a way that we first 
try to exclude the more common and the treatable conditions and that is what is important so we can't just label a patient uh, with a probable uh, cgd just like that we need to rule out the alternate diagnosis and that is what the diagnostic criteria also says the diagnostic criteria mentions very clearly that all the alternate diagnoses have been ruled out and that means we have worked up for other etiologies okay uh, sir you i just got a word you just mentioned that prion diseases are often fatal and they have no cure it's not treatable so uh, how do you approach discussions about its prognosis and also care uh, with patients and, and their families so as i discussed earlier first the doctor has to be very sure it's really prion disease when we say the prion disease we actually rule out the alternative uh, diagnosis and we have sent a uh, you know marker for prion disease as in 1433 and we have got those periodic discharges in the eg uh, clinically patient fits into the diagnosis of prion disease mri also suggests so when all of it fits in then we sort of confront the patient's family members then that see this is uh, these are all our possibilities we try to evaluate uh, extensively we try to rule out other differentials and this is what uh, we believe that the patient is having prion disease which is incurable and uh, it's very important to mention uh, the family members that we have tried our best in terms of ruling out other disorders and we should not label any uh, with the, we should not label the patient as having prion disease without any extensive work because uh, there is no definitive test the 1433 uh, uh, that we do doesn't have that much of a specificity the specificity is somewhere around uh, 65 to 75% So we can't just label the patient just like that without doing adequate workup for differentials. So that is the first aspect. The second aspect is to let them know that the, about the transmissibility of this disease. So uh, it's not uh, uh, very common for the disease to get transmitted uh, through the route of fomites and all. But the due precaution has to be taken uh, while handling a patient with uh, prion disease. because they are known to uh, transmit through surgical procedure and uh, the transmission through blood route is very controversial still every st- every uh, you know precaution has to be taken while handling those patient because of the fatality of the disease and they have to be strictly uh, you know uh, they have to be counseled regarding the outcome and what that there is no treatment available and also about the symptomatic treatment Uh, as in uh, adding medication to relieve the pain adding medication to maintain the sleep hygiene to uh, uh, adding medications to improve the behavior of the patient to improve the myoclonus or seizure so whatever you can do for the patient that has to be done yes uh, very true very correctly said now um, now we're talking about the treatment aspect uh, that we were discussing earlier so uh, what according to you are the challenges in developing effective treatments or even if i talk about vaccines uh, for prion diseases prion is a, is a very uh, uh, different kind of uh, it's not an organism it's just a protein lying somewhere and uh, what it is that the protein uh, uh, has uh, some specific characteristics so uh, whenever the protein gets infected with the uh, uh, with the prion which is actually a protein so what it does that it tends to uh, make each and every protein around uh, in the organism infected so uh, if a prion disease comes in contact with the surrounding proteins it makes all the other protein mo- uh, protein molecules prion proteins now these prion proteins have some conformational changes so they have more of beta pl- uh, plated structure than the alpha helix structure due to which the conformation of the protein molecule changes and its function is affected when the function of the protein molecule gets affected this protein molecule leads to the uh, breakdown of the normal machinery of the cell due to which vital functions are affected and ultimately it all leads to neurodegeneration and all of it happens at a rapid staggering rate now uh, when we imagine a p- uh, person having uh, you know a disease we either believe that it is a neurodegenerative disease which is not effect infective or we believe it is infective now this particular disease lies somewhere between the two it's sort of an infective but it is not infective in a way that it is not caused by any organism okay it's not a cell it's not a virus not a bacteria it's just a protein so what do we do 
so maybe if we try to make a vaccine against that that is a theoretical possibility there have been trials regarding the vaccination for prion proteins but we have not got any breakthrough in this regard but the uh, trials are undergoing then there is the other approach is immunomodulation so uh, uh, there is there was a trial for a monoclonal antibody against the prion protein so again they have not got any breakthrough in that as well but it's all in the trial staging because it's a protein it's very difficult to make anything against that that works uh, because it does not follow uh, many of the rules of uh, uh, being a virus or being a bacteria and when we do something against the protein uh, because it it does not even have any genetic material of its own it's, it's just a protein so it's very difficult to uh, get through that and although the trials are ongoing none of them have shown any sort of promising results as of now so they tried for many antibiotics they tried flu protein they tried uh, monoclonal antibodies even anti uh, asos uh, mic rnas but nothing has resulted uh, in any uh, any uh, reduction in the mortality or prolongation of survival as of now great uh- Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rahul, for joining us today at Medical Dialogues and uh, giving us all the valuable insights about prion diseases and how it is a rare disease and uh, one should get to know about it. And neurologists specifically, as you mentioned, there are certain diagnostic criteria that one can follow to come to a diagnosis for an early detection and prompt treatment for, to be provided for it. So, uh, thank you for giving us all your insights on the disease and uh, thank you for joining us today at Medical Dialogues. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe and press the bell icon.